Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk to you about coordinated aggregation of distributed resources. I'm not going to assume too much power systems background, uh, but th this is an area where there's a lot of activity. Uh, so this is joint work with some of my students, Anand and Manuel. They're my graduate students, and two of my postdocs, Elliot who is going to Cornell, and Josh Taylor, who is on the job market now, and my colleagues, uh, Duncan and Praveen is our intellectual leader of our group, and another colleague, Pramod, from Florida. Uh, so the outline of my talk is as follows. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the GRIP architecture that we're dealing with, and uh, then I'll tell, tell you about distributed energy resources, coordinate aggregation, and then resource scheduling. Okay, so what's the problem? The, 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 the power systems are changing very, very rapidly. You know, we have now lots of resources at the distribution side. The distribution side was typically in the past just viewed as power on demand. You turn on the you get your power, okay? But now the distribution side has more intelligence and more flexibility, more generation. So we see things like storage, those have to be scheduled. Controllable loads like electrical vehicle charging or you know, HVACs, other thermostatically controlled loads. And a lot of distributed microgeneration like rooftop solar. Uh, you know, in many, many houses you have, they generate power to be consumed in the house and also they shove it back on the grid. So things are changing. And the target at, in, uh, in California is to have uh, greater than 30% of the net energy coming from renewables. You know, that's a very aggressive target. And one can argue that if you want that penetration of renewables, you must put the bulk of them on the distribution side. So you have two choices. You can have large wind farms on the transmission side, or you can have lots of rooftop solar on the distribution side. If you have deep penetration of renewables, there's the emerging consensus that a lot of these have to be on the distribution side. And I'll argue why. The benefit is that power is consumed and generated locally, so you don't have long-distance transmission losses. That's, that's one of the benefits. And what, what we see happening in the next 30 years uh, is that the core grid diminishes in function. So you know, the role of the independent system operator as managing loads, you know, the, the managing power quality, managing flexibility, that, that entire responsibility then sort of migrates to the, to the periphery. So we call this, uh, this new architecture GRIP. It's grids with intelligent periphery. And there are a number of people who I, whose names I should have put, put up have contributed to our architectural papers. Anjan Bose, Felix Wu, Stephen Lowe, just a lot of people, Sasha von Meyer. Uh, the idea is this is what the grid looks like now. The, the big, thick, black arrows are the transmission side, and they're to suggest they're thick, to suggest they carry a lot of power. In the future, you have, well, lots of clusters where power is generated, consumed, and it's, it's a much more distributed architecture. You have storage, you have uh, generation, you have loads that can be controlled. So uh, there's, there's a lot of... There's, there's a fair consensus that this is going to happen, that you're going to have a very intelligent distributed periphery. And there are a lot of, uh, in fact, the EU is way ahead of uh, us in, uh, in terms of thinking about these architectures. So there are big EU projects called Dispower Phoenix. And you know, these are very large, you know, 30 university, uh, huge sort of consortia. And they've done a lot of work in thinking about this architecture. NIST is a U.S. body that sets standards, and they're trying to sort of develop uh, like 802.11 ABN sort of interoperability standards for, for this. Uh, I, I won't talk much about that. So why do we want to invest all these, uh, these resources at the distribution end as opposed to wind farms on the transmission side? Well, the biggest, at least in the United States, the biggest reason for doing this is if you have a renewable source on the transmission side, remember the renewable sources like solar or wind, they go up and down, you have to size it, size the transmission capacity for peak. Okay? You can't just size it for average, at least without storage. And this means that you have to revamp your transmission infrastructure. 
and it's simply too expensive to do this. Uh, so uh, by having distributed generation, you don't have to go back and get land rights and size, resize all the, 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 the aging transmission infrastructure. The United States really has third world transmission infrastructure because we just haven't been investing in this. We've been investing in things like wars, which are you know, more, more profitable for some people, I guess. Um, there's also increased operational flexibility. If I, have a dist if I have an island where I'm generating and consuming power and there's a, there's a blackout or a problem, I can, I can cut that island off. You know? So you can do things like managing in contingencies more intelligently. Uh, the biggest problem with renewables is this operating reserve. So because the renewables go up and down, you have to have backup power coming from someplace. So these are called reserves. Sometimes your renewables make too much energy, so you need down-regulation reserves. That is, you have to have somebody, say, either increasing their demand or reducing their generation. Sometimes you don't have enough generation from the renewables, in which case you need up-regulation reserves. So there are two kinds of reserves that you need. And this is the single biggest problem in, in, in reaching a 30% renewable integration target, okay? the cost of reserves. Now, there are many countries, particularly in Europe, that have managed, uh, say, 30% or more renewables. Uh, let's take hydro, and Norway is a very special case. They have a lot of hydro, so effectively they have big amounts of storage. But take Spain, that doesn't have that much hydro, but they have a lot of renewables. How did they deal with this? Well, they have 100% reserves, and that's expensive. And who pays for this? The Spanish consumer. So... It's possible to do this with reserves, but it's just too expensive. You know, the, the, the average, you know, the, the price per kilowatt hour in Spain is four, five, six times higher than the price per kilowatt hour in the United States, even more. So we think that there are a lot of, uh, I'm not going to go through this list. I'm going to leave the slides with uh, whoever wants to uh, take a look at them later. But the, there, is, there are a lot of benefits for moving generation to the transmission side, to the distribution side, to having distributed renewables. Uh, so you can use the distribution network a lot better. You can generate, uh, you can generate ancillary services like regulation on the distribution, and there, there are lots of, lots of reasons for doing this. Okay, so as I showed in the picture, so on the distribution side, there are going to be all these clusters of resources. So you can imagine, you know, the KTH cluster. You'll have some storage, you'll have some loads that are programmable and controllable. And, you know, there are two kinds of clusters. One kind of cluster might be just a resource cluster where I, I simply coordinate all these resources to give something of value to the grid. For example, the grid might want to shake peak, peak power. So sometimes it's a very hot day and, you know, all the lines are loaded, so they may contact KTH and say, listen, I want you to cut back on your power consumption by 10%. In exchange, we'll pay you this much. So, you know, these, these uh, resource clusters can bid into ancillary services markets like peak shaving, like frequency regulation, or like inertia, and make money that way. Another kind of cluster is this balanced cluster. So there, there are entire communities uh, in the United States, like Marin County, for example, is almost off the grid. They're independent agents, and occasionally they, they need power. They have a surplus of power. They sell it back to the grid, and they have a shortage. They, they buy from the grid. So they are, they are little communities that are internally balanced, and they, they present a constant load to the grid. Okay? So that's a different kind of a cluster. And you know, clusters are, are likely to be geographically... Uh, tied together, localized below a large, say, 100 megawatt substation. And the reason is you have to worry when you deliver power. It's not like the Internet. A lot of people have made connections between power systems and the Internet. You know? So it's not, you can't, like, I cannot, I, in the Internet, I can send a package from me to, to Kale, you know, but I can't send power. You know, it's, not, it, it's not packetizable or addressable like this. Uh, there's, no, there's no fabric, there's no matrix where I can do packet switching. Uh, so there are a lot of constraints. For example, power quality is, is voltage and frequency. And you know, for these reasons, and phase balance, for these reasons, it's likely a cluster is going to be a geographically constrained identity. Okay? So 
coordinating this cluster of resources will be a cluster manager. So I'm telling you about how, what we think of our architecture. I'm not going to get into all the layers, uh, the layered hierarchy of the architecture. Like, uh, 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 so the, what the cluster manager does is they represent these aggregated resources to the system operator that manages the grid. And they schedule and control the resources to deliver some promised uh, function to the grid. And it's really an independent business agent. And we see this emerging already of these business opportunities of cluster managers. So what do they do? Ex ante, that is beforehand, suppose I'm a cluster manager and you know, I'm in, I own the, ETA, the KTH resources. Then I can interrogate all my resources at any given time and I can see what is their capability, say, 24 hours from now. And based on my forecast, I will offer, in, I will make bids into either bulk or ancillary services markets. And then, then in real time, then let's say the bid is accepted for delivery, say 24 hours from now. At delivery time, I have to schedule my resources. I have to then at real time decide, oh, which lights do I turn on? Which lights do I turn off? Or if I have, a, if I have there's an excess of power, you know, can I... Can I store uh, hot water someplace? Can I do these things? So I have, to, I have to coordinate all my resources. And I have to issue unit commands to all the resources. And then, and then afterwards, ex post, I have to do settlement. You have to uh, reward people fairly. You have to do auditing and things like this. OK, so that's the architectural piece. And we have, again, you know, a, fair, a fairly comprehensive paper on this that I'm, I'm happy to share with you. But now I want to go into some specifics. I want to tell you about, about, manage, about the optimization problems that, that come up in managing distributed energy resources. So uh, we're going to have controllable loads. So these aren't uh, on-demand power loads. It isn't that you turn something on and you exit. They're, they're not consumers of power. They're consumers of energy. If I charge an electric vehicle, I expect so much energy in, in this window. I don't care whether you charge me slowly first and fast later. So I'm a flexible load. I'm an energy consumer, not a power consumer. So there are many loads like this that can be controlled. Of course, they need the attendant communication infrastructure to be able to do this. And I'll talk to you about that. And the other distributed energy resources are electricity storage on the distributed side and distributed renewables, like rooftop solar. And there's a, there's a big, you know, every, it's very easy to, to make the claim Okay, distributed energy resources can absorb the variability in renewable generation. So my renewable generation, wind or solar, is up and down and up and down, and I'm going to use electric vehicles to absorb that variability. I'll charge when there's power. I won't charge when there's, when there's a shortage. It's very easy to say that, but the detail is really what, what makes it very challenging. So what variability? Are we talking about the variability in utility-scale wind farms? in rooftop solar, what time scales? What do you do with wind? Are you talking about the variability in wind ramps or just routine fluctuations? So a lot of details have to be really worked out uh, because you can't just leave 5% you know, of your customers unhappy at any, given, at any given time. And the real hard thing is how much reserves do you need? Reserves are backup power. So suppose your wind farm dies or your solar energy dies, and you have to get it, get these reserves from somewhere. There are, two kinds of there are two kinds of costs. Capacity, which I pay up front. It's like a reservation cost. I want to reserve so many megawatts generation capacity as backup power. And if I choose to use some of that capacity, then I pay an energy use cost. So it's like buying a reservation it gives you the right, but not the obligation to use that resource. And then a second cost of if I actually use that, that reserve. Uh, OK. Uh, power balance. So I have a available generation G. And it, com it consists of a bulk power, which I, you know, is typically like a nuclear or a coal or a big, big thermal plant, bulk power B. And then I have some uh, reserve powers R. And then I have my wind or renewable generate or rooftop solar W. And the load is, consists of two parts, conventional load that you just have to service, and flexible loads, flexible loads that you can turn things on and off. And you can say, well, a fraction delta of the total power is this flexible load. And you can, you can fool around with this participating factor and see 
you know, what happens if only 10% of my loads are participating in a program that lets me turn them on and off. So here's the picture. I have bulk power that's coming from the legacy grid. I have renewables that's either coming from the transmission side or the distribution side. And I have backup power reserves. And they together are, make up the available power that I have to service my loads. Okay? And these, you service two kinds of loads, flexible loads and conventional loads. So that's the picture. It's very simplified. I've ignored sort of network aspects, you know, that I have generation in very, various different parts. And there's transmission capacity constraints. This is just a single bus sort of picture here. So what are the decisions to be made? Well, there are multiple purchase, there are multiple market opportunities. So T is the delivery time. T minus 24 is a day ahead. T minus six is six hours ahead, one hour ahead, etc. And in these various markets, at each opportunity, you decide three things. You decide how much bulk power you want to buy. Okay, that's it's a flat, say typically in, in one hour or 15 minute blocks. You decide how much reserve capacity you need for upregulation. That is, if I if I'm short on power, then I can I can use the reserves how much down regulation reserves you need. If I have too much power, somebody's going to turn off, absorb this excess. And, you, and you know, these are, there are some prices that are available. And you make these decisions based on either a knowledge or a forecast or a model of these prices. So, uh, and then you make these decisions going. This, this entire process is called risk limiting dispatch. And it's a special case of stochastic optimal control. And there's a wonderful paper. It was really, I guess, Praveen Varaya uh, started working on risk limiting dispatch a long time ago. There's a very, very clean paper uh, that he has. It's a little bit thick, but it's very, very nice. OK. Um, so that's the previous slide was, what are the decisions made beforehand? The next slide, this slide, is what are the decisions made in real time? In real time, so during this operating hour 0w, I have to decide uh, how much reserves to call on in real time. That's the scheduling problem for reserves. I have to decide how much, uh, how do I operate my storage in real time? Do I in inject into this storage or extract from that storage? And I have to decide how to schedule my flexible loads. Do I give you power now? Do I give you power later? And so on. So these scheduling policies have to, have to, have to use all available information causally in real time. So that's a, that's a difficult constraint. So uh, this is the timeline. You have the day ahead, and then you have hour ahead where you make these, these risk-limiting dispatch decisions. And during the delivery window, you make real-time scheduling decisions. So that's the picture. And you can have this optimal control problem, if you like, or uh, for optimizing both dispatch and scheduling. And this is a class of optimization problems that seems to come up a lot in power systems. So it is minimize certain decisions you have to make. How much bulk power you have to buy, how much reserve power you have to buy in the first market based on available information there. Then second market based on more information. Third market based on more information. And then expected value over your randomness, which in this case is the renewables, some economic cost function over here. And here I have my real-time scheduling decisions that I make. So this is, a, this is a class of stochastic optimal control problems that come up. And they're difficult. They're difficult problems. Um, so in here, IK is the information available at decision, at, at decision stage K. J is some economic cost. And I have constraints. So what if I don't have enough? power to meet all my demands. So you have to pay a penalty, and that's called a loss of load penalty. There are other con the other constraints are these scheduling policies have to be causal based on available information. So the problem is sort of similar to the general risk limiting dispatch, except that I have these, these uh, real-time decisions that I have to make. And that changes it quite a bit. So it's not the same. And it becomes a, a substantially more difficult problem because of the causal scheduling policies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try a much simpler problem to give you a flavor of how difficult these optimization problems are. I'm not going to consider storage. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to try, try to take a very simple problem of simply resource scheduling. So here's the idea. 
so I'm on now the second part of the talk here. I'm going to deal with flexible loads. For example, an electric vehicle. And how will I model an electric vehicle? It arrives at time A, it departs at time T, D, arrival A, departure T, it needs a certain energy E, and you can charge it only at a maximum rate of M. So the integral from arrival to departure, the integral from arrival to departure of the power it receives has to be equal to the energy demanded. And the rate of charge has to be bigger than, smaller than the maximum rate and greater than zero because I'm not going to think of vehicle to grid. I'm not going to think of the vehicle as a resource for the grid. Okay, and there's, there's some debate about that. Uh, if you can also add minimum charging rates, so I must charge at a certain minimum rate or zero, but that makes problems much harder because then you get integer, integer programming problems. Uh, you can also model, for example, an HVAC in a very similar way. I won't get into the details. There are many details I'm ignoring. For example, an electric vehicle, well, it doesn't need exactly the energy E. Maybe it's good to charge it between 95% and 100%. You know, um, also there are quantized power levels an electric vehicle charger can accept at certain rates. And also there's latencies in communicating to the charger. All the, there are huge numbers of details I've ignored here. But the bottom line is I'm going to model, next slide, all these flexible loads as tasks. You have to complete. Each task has four parameters here. Arrival time, departure time, maximum service rate, and how much energy they have to deliver. So the constraint is integral A to D power is equal to the energy demanded, and the rate of the power has to be between zero and n. That's it. So a task, like, it, like you come home, you plug in your electric vehicle. There's some SMS or some communication technology, whatever's appropriate, that communicates to the cluster manager, says, ah, I'm here, I'm a task, I've arrived, service me. Okay, and it communicates, of course, it knows the arrival time, it publishes that, it, it publishes a departure time, and it knows from the kind of technology it is the maximum service rate, and it looks at how much energy I need. Okay, so what we see is like when you come home and you plug in your electric vehicle, there'll be sort of three choices. You know, there'll be like, uh, like you get unleaded, 95% leaded, or, you know, or very super unleaded, three different prices. You know, and so that's what we see. So because if you offer that you will accept your charge in a much bigger interval of time, then you're, you're selling flexibility to the grid, and so you should pay much less for your gasoline. Okay? So that's the way we're thinking. We're, we're setting up actually a big experiment in Singapore about this, but we'll come to that later. So the task announces its parameters to the cluster manager upon arrival. This is very important. The tasks are preemptive. This means that you can interrupt them and resume them at will. Once it, there are some tasks that are, for example, in computers in, in uh, batch programming, there are some jobs that are not preemptible. So once you start a task, you must service it. Okay? So we're allowing that you can interrupt and resume tasks at will. If you don't do that, all your optimization problems become NP-hard. They become equivalent to bin packing which is known to be like sharp peak complete, very bad problem. So here's the picture. This is the time axis. This dashed line is the current time. And these bars are the time intervals of a task. So that one, it hasn't come yet. I don't know that it has come yet, but let's say I have an oracle. It starts here, it ends there. So there are some tasks that intersect the current time. Those are in blue. And those are called the active tasks. So those are the tasks about which I do have information. Those are the ones that I could service at the current time. Okay. Uh, so well, the ener uh, so I need one more thing. The energy state of a task is how much energy is left to service it. Remember, the task required an energy E, but I've already spent a certain. I've already charged it a little bit. So little e of t is how much charge is left over. Okay? So ideally, you would like little e at the departure time to be zero. That means I've serviced that task. Okay? So uh, what information is available? 
uh, we call this the information state. You know the task parameters, you know the energy states, and you know the past values of the of available power profile. And what you want to do is schedule the tasks. So I've, I've considered a very simple problem. I've taken away all the bulk power, the 24-hour head market, no storage, no, just scheduling tasks. Because scheduling is a problem that appears a lot in the computer science literature. So I want to exploit some of those ideas. So a scheduling policy is one that does the following. It takes your available power profile. So G of T is the total power you have at time T to service these 100 tasks. And it decides, well, I'm going to give this much to you, this much to you, this much to you. That's called, that's called a task scheduling policy, sigma. And it, so it allocates P1 to the first task, P2, PM to the mth task, where M is the number of tasks that are active at time t. And of course, the allocation must be so that the total allocation has to be smaller than the available power at that time. And it must be causal. So there's a lot of related work. Lang Tong deals with, uh, say, charging of electric vehicles at a mall, OK, and pricing, and how you do penalty functions of this very nice paper. Anna Scalione deals with, uh, again, this task scheduling, but she does not allow preempting of the tasks. And so she uses a, uses a queuing theory model. And I think the problem becomes unnecessarily complicated. I do think it's real, re reasonable to allow preempting the tasks. Uh, Duncan Calloway has done some, uh, and Steve Lowe have done work on uh, scheduling tasks to do valley filling. And so that's another uh, s related sets of work. OK. So some definitions. A power profile is said to be feasible if there is some policy, maybe non-causal, that keeps that, uh, that uh, completes all the tasks. OK? So uh, the policy is called feasible. So the, sorry, the, the generation profile, GFT, is called feasible if there's, it's enough to charge all, to finish all the tasks, OK? To complete all the tasks. And a policy is called optimal if allocations under sigma uh, complete uh, all the tasks for any uh, feasible power profile. So if I know there's enough power, power, and if I use the policy sigma, then it will complete all the tasks. So the easiest policy, all these policies, you basically make a priority stack. Which one do you service first? Well, the, the simplest one is earliest deadline first. So you look at all your tasks, and you see which guy has come, f which one has the earliest deadline. And you service that task first. If you have any power left over, you service the one with the second earliest deadline, and ties are broken arbitrarily. OK, so it requires very little information to implement. And one can show that uh, EDF is optimal uh, if you do not have rate constraints. OK, so if, if there are no charging rate limits, then it is optimal. There's another policy called least laxity first. And here's how it works. So, T is the current time. That's where I am now. D is the deadline for that task. So D minus T is how much time I have remaining. OK, that's how much time I have left. And I have to give that task energy E of T. But the maximum service rate is M. So if I divide, this is the time required, even if I service at the, at the fastest possible rate. So my flexibility, if you like, is the time remaining minus the time required, so it's phi of t. Okay? So tasks that are, have no flexibility, phi of t equals 0. So this is called the laxity phi of t. So you schedule based on least laxity first. So a, a job that has no laxity, that means they have no wiggle room, you've got to service it first. Okay? So again, one can show that laxity-based policies are optimal, uh, but, uh, but let's do some examples. That will be good. I have two tasks, A and B. And A looks like I have to deliver two units of energy at the maximum rate of 2 over this interval 0 to 2. So uh, that's what it looks like. So uh, this, what I've shown here is, is the available power profile. Sorry, And in task A, so what is the total energy I need? 2 for A, 2 for B, which is 4. And the area under this curve is 4. It's 2 times 2. But the maximum rate for A is 2, so I, and I, so I have to, uh, uh, sorry, the maximum rate for, 
for B is one, so I have to charge B like this. I cannot charge it at bigger than one, and the leftover energy goes to A. On the other hand, if my available power profile is like this, then you can see that A, task A, is only operating on zero to two, zero to two, so all the energy has to go to A, and all this energy has to go to B. If you compare these two examples, the available power profile, which is shown here, was identical for the first one second. And yet, the optimal policies are different for the first one, for the first one second. Okay, that's what this example shows. So, we can write down the following theorem. Is that causal optimal policies that respect rate limits do not exist. Okay, so one can show that you cannot schedule these tasks while respecting the rate limits causally. Uh, so one can write that as a simple theorem. Uh, so anyway, so the idea is since you, you, you can't do things causally, you have to forecast the arrivals of tasks. You have to worry about this. So the natural way to do this is receding horizon control, or if you're, if you're familiar with the term, MPC. Okay. Now, there's a lot of work on MPC uh, specifically as applied to power systems, to electric vehicle charging, to resource allocation. A tremendous, if you do Google MPC power systems, you'll get like 200 papers, okay? And so, but the difference is, the difference between one MPC paper and another one is how they define the cost function. Sometimes it's done nicely and it works. Sometimes it's done heuristically and they hit you with like 400 simulations. So the magic is all in the choice of the task function. Uh, there's some very nice work by Goran, by Goran or Joran, Joran Anderson's group uh, on, on MPC as applied to electric vehicle charging, and they take a very, very nice practical uh, bent here, so I could encourage you to look at it. There's some other work by Illich and, and She Le uh, who look at MPC in its complete generality. I haven't quite figured out what's in those papers yet. So let me just skip the math, okay? And let me tell you the following. If you know your generation, even if you know how much power you have on your service interval, there does not exist a causal scheduling policy, okay? So not only do you have to know the arrivals or forecast the arrivals and departures of tasks, you have to forecast the available generation. Okay, so what this first theorem says is that even if you knew your generation, it's not enough. You have to know also or forecast your, your tasks. Uh, but, but there is some hope that if you have uh, an identical service interval for all, all tasks, then least laxity first is optimal, even with rate constraints. So uh, that gets a little technical. So if I have, uh, so what I'm saying here is that assume the service intervals are identical for all tasks. So everybody has to be serviced on the same interval. And you say, where, where did that come from? You know, because, you know, Henrik may come in and say, I need my electric vehicle, you know, between charge between, say, 8 p.m. and he goes to work very early, 4 a.m. Okay, I could block it off into hour-long segments so everybody is aligned on these hour blocks. So there's a suboptimal way where that theorem is useful. Okay, so we did a simulation. We did a, a hundred vehicles. Uh, we took actually published data from you know, electric vehicle arrivals, departures. We took the, the battery maximum charging rates and we wind data. And we, we asked, you know, well, does do flexible loads let you absorb the variability in wind from one of these wind farms? And we used an MPC strategy. And here's what happens. If you don't use any coordination and you just say, you know, every electric vehicle is charged the minute it arrives at, the, at a flat rate over the entire service interval, then what you see is the following. The green curve, the, the, well, this curve is the wind power and the red is what's used, and the blue is what's needed. So the blue has to come from reserves, the green is the renewable that is wasted, and that's without coordination. Now here you can see there's much less 
wastage of renewables and less reserves that are used. Okay, so it's better. Uh, and this is earliest deadline first. And least laxity first is, is sort of, it does use less reserves, but the reserve capacity you need, which is the maximum amount at any given time of reserves is quite large. So that's a bad policy. MPC works very nicely. It's, it, it requires very little reserve capacity and energy use. So the distinction, it's not the area under this curve that's important because it's the maximum vertical line, that much reserve capacity, you have to schedule a priori. So bottom line is, is that uh, MPC works very nicely and the, the criterion we used here was based on a least laxity first cost function, okay? So we're borrowing ideas from computer science, uh, the real-time scheduling ideas in computer science to do this. Okay, great, I'm gonna skip this. Now, let's go back to the, the general problem. Your cost function consists of bulk power purchases in various markets, reserve, up regulation reserves in various markets, down regulation reserves in various markets, up regulation energy use, down regulation energy use at these prices. So the prices are Qs and Cs and Ps. And there are constraints. Uh, that is, it's called a loss of load probability constraint. That is, you have to be able to service uh, your tasks with very high probability. So this was the optimization problem uh, that I had before. Very, very hard and ugly. So in the scheduling stuff, I ignored all of this. And I just focused on scheduling tasks. But now we're going to go back to this problem and look at a special case. And we're going to look at the special case where there's only one forward market. So you just have to buy your bulk power and your reserves. I'm going to assume symmetrical reserve costs. So up and down regulation costs the same. And so there's the cost of the reserves. There's the cost of the bulk power. And then this is the cost of using the reserves, whether it's up or down. And X is the excess reserves that you need beyond what you purchased ex ante. Okay, so I needed a certain amount of reserves larger than what I had. And there's, a there's an extreme penalty because this will be a real-time price, D. And then this is the energy balance. So this is a, a simpler problem. And the reason it's much simpler is, well, firstly, I don't have storage. And I have one task. I'm only dealing with one task. I, you know, I've taken the task scheduling off the table. Even this is very, very interesting. It's still a stochastic optimal control problem. And here's roughly the solution. I'm not going to write down, actually, the formal solution is, is not exactly this, but this is close enough. What you do is you look at the wind or the renewables averaged over the interval 0 to W where you service it. And call that random variable V. What you do in the day, day ahead is you purchase bulk power so that the, power, the bulk power plus the average of the wind you're going to get in that interval is equal to the energy you need for the task divided by the window, the task window. So this is how much you buy. And you typically buy reserves equal to three times the variance of V. Okay? Right there you see a benefit because today people buy reserves at three times the standard deviation of the wind or the re reserves, uh, uh, sorry, the renewables. But you can buy three times the standard deviation of the average over the service interval of the, vari of the renewables because, I, because, the task, because the tasks are flexible. So it doesn't matter when in that service interval I get my energy, I can use it for that task. So th this is th the key thing is I only have to worry about sigma v. But then you can go forward and ask, how do I decide on scheduling the reserves? And so here's what happens. Okay, you can sort of ignore this slide for a minute. So let's say I have bought a certain amount of reserve capacity capital. And I get, I have this random renewable power process that's coming my way. And should I be using energy from the reserves 
or should I wait till the last minute and see how much I need? Okay, so the idea is this. If my forecast of my, of my, uh, if the forecast of my wind or my renewables is accurate, then I just, I don't, I don't use reserves until the last minute. And then I see how much reserves I, I need, and then I use, because all along, sometimes I'm gonna need up reserves, sometimes I'm gonna need down reserves, and they kind of cancel. But if I pay for it as I go along, I'm paying too much, so you wait till, till the end. So this turns out to be one extreme of the optimal control problem. The other extreme is if I have a poor forecast of my renewables, then I should use a running reserves, which are the departure from the mean. So it's sort of, it's sort of reminiscent of a bias variance trade-off. It's a particularly interesting sort of stochastic optimal control problem, and there are two solutions at two extremes. And uh, we are still trying to work out what the general, general solution is. The general principle, what we're trying to, to do is this. We want to come up with a single number W, okay? Uh, sorry, a single, uh, sorry. We want to come up with a single parameter. And this parameter is a window over which you do average, okay? So I have all these flexible loads, and I want to represent their aggregate capability. Everybody's flexible a little bit, a little bit, so I can represent their capability by a single number. And that number is really the width of a convolution kernel over which I average your loads. And so then the system operator has to forecast the wind, not point by point, but averaged over these in sliding windows of width w. So this is where we're heading, because we want to make things that are legacy compatible. That's the, the idea, okay? So, and I've done a lot here, maybe too much, I should have focused on one thing. Okay, so there are many, many open issues, by, by no means. We, we've sort of isolated a few mathematical problems. They look like min over x, min over y, expected value over z, cost function of x, y, and z. Okay, a very interesting class of problems. But if you go on, you know, beyond writing papers, if you really want to make money in this opportunity, and we, we do, um, you know, is there a market? You know, so if I pay you to defer using, to be flexible with your electric vehicle charge, or flexible with your washing machine, you know, is there a market? Is there a substantial market to, that will allow me to, you know, for me, it's very valuable. But for you, if I'm offering you $10 a month, to participate, ah, you just throw it away because ten dollars a month, and particularly in Stockholm, is not worth much. Okay, so how do you ma how do you incentivize people to participate when there are small rewards? Okay, so there's uh, you could do fair revenue sharing. So you could say, well, let me divide my benefit by the number of participants, and then sort of you know sort of e even it out. But we, we don't think, a lot of people don't think it's going to work because people are not going to subscribe. If you save $10 a month or $20 a month, it's just not worth it, okay? So the idea that's gaining a lot of traction is lottery methods. And this really, uh, it's Balaji Prabhakar who's at Stanford. He's, he's the one who's sort of pushing this in a different context. So he uh, is very interested in how consumers react when there are small rewards. If you want to recycle a Coke can in the United States, you get five cents for being a good citizen and taking your can and putting it in the trash. Okay, five cents isn't much. But what they did at Stanford is the following. They did a lottery. Instead of five cents, you have a one in a thousand chance of winning $50. I think they actually did one in a hundred chance of winning $5. So that Coke can that you finished drinking, its expected value is five cents. But there's a chance that it's worth five dollars. So they, at Stanford, they had these specialized recycling machines that they put. And you take your Coke can, you put it in, and you draw a lever, and the wheels spin around. And with one in a hundred chance, you get instantly a five dollar bill or nothing. Recycling went from 5% to 98%, okay? This is how you reward, this is how you incentivize small rewards. Because 
you know, the, you have to you have to play with the with the utility functions of, of consumers, see where they are risk risk insensitive, and you know, and so. Uh, Balaji is going to Singapore in January to try this on the Singapore transportation system. Uh, that is to incentivize people to commute off rush hour. Uh, there's an article in The Economist written about this. I'm going to Singapore for nine months, starting in January, to, to try a lottery method to incentivize demand response. Can I do peak shaving? Can I do peak shifting? Can I set up a lottery mechanism? How do we, you know, how do you sort of price it? What is the interface? All these details. So we're actually going to set this up. The other really interesting thing we're starting to work on, this is a company that Praveen Varaya and myself have started, um, to use social networks. So there's a big, you know, everybody does Facebook and you know, all this stuff. Groupon, how many of you have heard of Groupon? Uh, so it's a very successful IPO. Uh, the way it works is you sign up, there's a coupon to use a certain, you get a discount at this restaurant, but you get it only if 100 people sign up, okay, by such and such a date. And, you know, all the, all the young people are always on, they're sort of on instant messaging, on these things all the time. You know, the faculty, of course, are online all the time, but they're doing LaTeX. Uh, the idea is 15 minutes, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour in advance, a utility like Pacific Gas and Electric knows that they've, they are going to suffer a huge penalty in the real-time market because the demand is high. And they need 30 minutes to schedule cheaper spinning reserves to come online. So they have a 15 to 20 minute window in which to get people to sign on to shed their load. So we, can we use a Groupon sort of, you know, publish immediately something, and if a sufficient number of people sign on, they get 10 bucks. Okay, so this is another experiment we want to try. And I, I, we think that these, these untapped sort of social network resources are really the way to go to extract the utility, you extract things from consumers as you need them, very quickly, okay? Because it's staggering the number of people that are online at any, at say 2 p.m. in the middle of the work day, sort of fooling around to see what's, what's available on Groupon, okay? Um, so that's, that's what I had to talk about. Um, there are lots and lots of open problems, and they sort of step away from traditional optimization. They move more towards sort of consumer psychology and things like that, which could be an interesting uh, challenge in the future. Thank you.